Hello my friends, it's the Game Boy Geek here, and today you play the role of an ancient vampire shaping 700 years of vampiric and human history. You'll be in the pursuit of ancient secrets while trying to evade the inquisition and insidious schemes of your fellow players. Vampire The Masquerade Heritage is a legacy game where each game, players gather characters from a common pool of their bloodlines. These characters influence different vampiric battlegrounds and help in fulfilling history-based missions. After any individual game, the players get to collect their achievements in their timeline, which serves as their chronicle of actions throughout 700 years of history, and also influences the final outcome of the campaign. Now eventually, the 700 years will end with a climactic conclusion as players scramble to unravel ancient mysteries using the clues, allies, and power that they've gathered throughout the entire campaign. Vampire the Masquerade Heritage is for two to four players, takes about 20 minutes per player to play, and is published by Nice Games Publishing. It's on Kickstarter right now, so I'm gonna show you how the game works, and then I'll see you on the other side. Now this is a Kickstarter preview, so all the art, components, and everything you see here is prototype material. You'll want to check the Kickstarter link in the description of this video to see all the final art and components. At the beginning of the game, everybody gets to pick one of these envelopes from the different clans. and In there is going to be different cards and things that you'll have to start the game. Now I'm going to show you just a basic single game, but these are important because as the game goes on in the campaign, you'll be getting different things, unlocking new things, and you'll be placing them in your clan's envelope for future games. For example, at the beginning of the first game, it will have your clan's leader, it will have some clan tokens and some scheme cards that you'll be trying to fulfill certain things to play throughout the game. We'll show you more about these in just a moment. Now here's the main board for the game. The game is played over 10 rounds, and each round, players are going to be taking actions, like recruiting characters from here and adding it to their bloodline, similar to like a family tree. Optionally, they might be able to finish some different missions, depending on who they have in their bloodline, and they might be able to activate some scheme cards that players start with at the beginning of the game. So everybody's clan leader is going to be the top of their clan, and different characters are going to be coming off them, sort of splitting like a family tree, and each of the clan leaders has a special ability. Like this one says we start with five scheme cards instead of three. We'll go over what these do a little bit later. Now, each character in the game has three different attributes, and these are going to be tracked by different colors. We'll go over what these mean a little bit later and how you use them. Now, another main part of the game is these three different battlegrounds. There's always three in each game, but during a campaign, as you go through the different games, different and new battlegrounds will be coming in, and some of them will be being removed. So each game in the campaign is going to feel a little bit different. So here we have the board. Again, recruiting a character is very simple. On your turn, you can recruit any of these characters. However, if you recruit this one or this one, you actually have to pay glory, which essentially is points. Players start with glory. They're like these little diamonds. Uh, but you'll have to pay those if you want some of the characters that are the newest ones available. So let's say uh, that player is going to recruit this one here. They'll simply take this and they'll add it to their bloodline. So here we've decided to add this person here. It's kind of coming down like as a child here. And then maybe next time I add a character, I could add it from a child to this one here or here, or maybe I can add it from a child here like that. That's how the family tree or your bloodline, if you will, is going to be created. Now, it's important that when you add characters like this to look at the attributes that you're getting. Now, anyone that's attached like this, this is considered sort of a group or a coterie, and that's going to be important when we talk about what you're trying to do in order to activate some of these scheme cards. But first, let's look at this. First, you're going to place this in your bloodline, and then we're going to, based upon these attributes, we're going to update all three battlefields. Now this is the battleground for of clans high and low, and it's split up into sort of noble and lowborns here. Now this is red, the first attribute. Now red is sort of an elitist or arrogant, where if it was green, if that first one was green, it would have been sort of more like a humble person. But because it was red, this moves one up this red track. It actually starts in the middle, and then it moves just like that. So this is going to be sort of a tug of war, because at the end of the game, whatever side this is on, red or green, you're going to get two points for each character that has that color attribute 
on there. So you're setting up yourself for end game points. Now the next battleground is the beast within. And in the middle ages, the vampires are fighting to keep their beast contained. We have a light side, uh, this way and a dark side down here. Everyone starts here and where your token is at the end of the game will get you points depending on this track. Now here we have yellow attribute. Now keep in mind this card is actually always in your bloodline. You never move them near these boards, but I'm just bringing them here to show you easily the attributes of this character, that, that the outcast that we recruited. So in this case, this is yellow. Now thematically yellow is calm, kind, and passive. And if it was blue, it would have been cruel, driven, or active. Now we look at the token of, the, of our faction, which is this one, and if it matches the color and it's on this light side, then we actually move it up one step like this, so we just gain some points. However, you, sometimes it will be on the dark side, and if you then match, it just moves to the light side, which again is going to allow you to start moving up as we just showed in future you know, character recruitments. However, let's say it was here, instead of recruiting that character, we, recru we recruited a blue character. And since it's opposite of the token color, it would flip, and if it was on the light side, it would move to the dark side like that. And if it already happened to have been here, it would actually move down the dark side. So that's a different way, and you're losing points. So that's a different way of trying to sort of match or not, and how it works different ways, it moves up and down the different tracks. Now the last of the three battlegrounds is the War of Princes, where there's different regions, and there's going to be battles for these different regions, and some of them come from the south, west, north, and east, and this is going to be sort of an area majority control for points, not only at the end of the game, but sometimes during the middle of the game as well. Now, if this character was recruited, you would see a, bl a blue. This would be these blue. This one is essentially from the west, and this is the one that you would sort of, you could move out to here or here or here following these lines to start for area control. However, the one that I recruited uh, was actually a wild. It has all of them, so you could do any of these. So let's say we move this one like this. Now this is, again, you're trying to get the most of the cubes in here uh, for, you know, for area control. Now let's say a little bit later someone else moved one here for black and then you move this one in here. Anytime you gain or maintain control, you can remove one of the cubes from the game, not to the supply, but from the game, to try to stay and have control of that. Now this is going to be important because at the end of the game, your characters that have the control of this will get points. We'll go over that a little bit at the end of the game. Now this is also important because as characters are being recruited, they're going to be refilled by this draw deck. And mixed in here are two cards that trigger the scoring of this as if it were the end of the game. Sort of, a, you know, the War of Princes, it, it, essentially it's a decisive moment. So this will score uh, twice throughout the game plus at the end of the game. And let's say that's all we did. We just recruited, we activated all of the different battlegrounds, and these would just slide down, new character would come out, and it'd be the next player's turn. Now let's say it's a little bit further in the game, and this is my bloodline. I want to point out that I have two of characters in my bloodline that have a white attribute, and I have two that have a light blue. This one's wild, and that one's a light blue like that. Now if we look at the missions available, this one does say two light blue and two white in your bloodline, so we can take this card because we have fulfilled this. Now what these say is you can gain status with a character when you fulfill this mission. So I could gain status. Now the clan leader, if you look at this color, this card is all colored. It's, it it's basically already has status. But these ones here, they're sort of monochrome looking. They don't yet have status. The bottoms of these have abilities. Now they're not available right away, but it gives you a sense of what will be available once they gain status. There's also some other things on the other side. So let's say we wanted to gain status on this one because it was part of uh, the people that helped me uh, gain that mission. So we'll take this out of the sleeve and flip it around and show you what it looks like. So now you'll notice it's in full color. Uh, and not only does it have the ability that was on, the, uh, on the, the other side that you could see, but it also has a second ability that you can activate. Now when you gain status, I'm not going to show you it here, but there are stickers in the game. And you'll place the sticker on here of your faction. You'll actually get to write the name of this character. Now this character will actually go back in the draw deck at the end of this game, and other players might be able to recruit this character in future games, but it wouldn't end up being a child. It actually would end up uh, going down like this. They still get to use them, but this one would not get to have more child, if you will. So it's, it's, you can still recruit it when it's not yours, but it's not as powerful. So let's look at this. This says, Schemer, discard any non-white attribute card from the center and gain uh, you know, a glory for each one. So all these three that do not have white on the bottom as an attribute would get discarded and that player would get three glory. So we'd add that there, but then this one says independent networks. You'd have to distribute four glory among white attribute vampires in other bloodlines, so essentially other players. 
Now let's say on a future turn, you recruit this character to your bloodline. Now, one optional thing you can do in your turn is play a scheme card. Now, these are cards that you started with at the beginning of the game with some in your hand, and these allow you to activate certain abilities and trigger certain effects. For example, we have, look at these icons. We have this here, we have this here that we just added, and this here. Now, these form a group or a coterie. Now, what happens is this one uh, is directly connected to these two childers below, and so this, this creates a group there. Now, because it suffices this, you can activate this, which is look for the chosen one, look at the top five cards of the character deck, and you can essentially recruit one of those as you're recruiting action for this turn. Now, to activate this, you must put one of your faction tokens on the leader of this quarter, which is the one that's the higher up. This just means that this one can't be the one to activate another quarter. Now, this icon could be used in another uh, quarter from this one, if it could be used. It just couldn't be, act be the one that's the top sire of this specific quarter because it's been activated already just this game. But there's other types of uh, cards that you might be able to use. Like sometimes you'll be using ones that are any one. So you could say, hey, you know what? I want to activate this one. We'll do this. And we could draw two characters from the deck and choose one of them for my recruiting action this turn. Sometimes you might need all, f uh, you know, four different icons. Sometimes you might need any two icons and things like that. But these are ways to activate certain abilities on your turn by forming these groups or quarteries. So you'll continue through 10 rounds, recruiting characters, possibly activating missions and uh, scheme cards. And at the end of the 10th round, you're gonna go through final scoring. And then in your bloodline, you'll get uh, points for each of the glory on any of your characters. Now, some of the characters might end up getting these yellow uh, tokens. Those are essentially negative points. Uh, also, some characters that you have gained status with that have stars on them might actually get you some end game points, like end game for each set of uh, Red and green gain two points, so you might be able to do that. For this battleground, again, whichever side it's on, red or green, each player will get two points for each character that's that's, a, that's either the, the green or the red. In this case, it's red, so each red character would get two points on every player's uh, bloodline. In the Beast Within, you'll get points just simply where you're at on that track. And here you'll look at who has the majority. The brown has majority in three areas. That's more than any other, and so in that case, uh, anyone that has a brown attribute uh, will get two points for each of their characters that has that. And they'll also get one point for every sort of wild or multicolor character. And whoever has the most points at the end is the winner. Now I had just shown you a basic game using some generic missions. You can play generic missions at any point during the campaign for people that aren't necessarily in the campaign. But you can do a campaign where there's going to be seven different chapters. And each chapter is going to have specific missions that go over uh, you know, different time periods. For example, on this one, they have different things to claim. So if you reach minus 11 on the Beast Within track, so for example, right here, if you're able to get all the way down there, which of course is minus 11 points if you were there at the end of the game, uh, you would claim this card. Now, you can fulfill this by reaching the minus 16 all the way. Now, if you claim a card but don't fulfill it, you lose points at the end of the game for that. Now, if you are able to fulfill it, uh, you basically would gain a new card that's unlockable. This is sort of a legacy game. You'd be adding that to your own envelope and you can move up two spaces on the Beast Within. So these different things are gonna unlock different things as you do these missions. And other things throughout the game will allow you to lock new characters, getting new cards and things like that, that you'd, you know, the, the, the new characters would go in the character deck, but new cards for you would go into your own clan uh, envelope. And there's also other envelopes that may unlock with all sorts of different things in there. So when I crack that envelope up, I've got all these different cards. And I'm not going to go over what these do, but just to show you that there's some unlockable material. Now, the first game starts with three of these uh, battlegrounds, and there'll always be three in play, but there's actually six other ones uh, that will be in the game. And then as you go through the campaign, you'll remove one, put one of the new ones in, so each game is different. And as you go on through the different chapters, there'll be different missions and things to accomplish. Well, there you have Vampire the Masquerade Heritage. And if you'd like to see the final art and components and the different pledge levels, you can click the link below me in the description of this video, and it will take you to the Kickstarter project page. And I'm sure the fine folks at Nice Games Publishing would love your support.